Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Reason We Learn. I'm your host, Deb Philman. At The Reason We Learn, we aspire to be part of the solution. The purpose of this show is to take a good, honest, potentially painful look at the way kids are being educated. We know we can do better, and this is where we'll talk about how. Let's learn something. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to The Reason We Learn. I am so glad you're here. Um, we have a big task ahead of us today. There's a lot to go through. So I'm going to be as brief as possible with the housekeeping. If you're new to the channel, please consider subscribing so you can be notified when I make more videos like this and go live. Um, please like and share this broadcast so more people can join us. This is an important topic for parents or anybody interested in education. Hello to everybody joining. Um, please have some like paper and a pencil or something to take notes. You may want to do that. And without further ado, I'm going to dive right in. I've gathered you here today to talk about something called Portrait of a Graduate. And rather than trying to explain to you what it is, I'm going to allow um, some folks to do that who pr produced a podcast about it because they think it's awesome. Um, I do not. And I'm going to play you some clips from the podcast. I won't be able to play the whole 10-minute podcast. But what I can do is suggest that you go and listen to it for yourself. And um, so, you, you know, I will uh, give you the, the link for that. Let me see if I can get you a share link um, and put it into the chat over here so that you can listen to it at your leisure. You can hear the whole thing. You can play it for your friends, uh, et cetera. Um, so let's go and listen to some of these clips. What I want you to do as you listen is consider whether you understand what they're saying, whether, you know, the words are just kind of going in your ear and you, you kind of think you understand it or, or not. Okay. So let's go. Um, all right. Here is the first clip about the Ed Leader 21 network that uh, you guys have set up that's a, a major initiative for you and how's it moving your mission forward? You know, the, the focus on high stakes accountability almost exclusively was taking a lot of the joy and love out of learning and we knew we had to do something different. And so we joined forces with Ed Leader 21, uh, which is a national network of about 150 to 170 schools all across the country, school district leaders really engaged in this work. Uh, and it's, it, it's an accelerator. It can help districts learn from each other's successes and learn. Okay. So did you hear the word accelerator in that? Okay. The reason that's important is that what she's talking about is something that's going to move the ball forward faster for what they're trying to do. So just keep that in mind. Okay. Let me go to the next one. Um, I had to do these in in clips because otherwise, um, yep, high stakes accountability, that's As another- Essential becomes the vision for a district. Uh, but so I'm sorry, what she's saying is portrait of a graduate becomes the vision for a district. So you heard high stakes accountability, right? They don't like that. They don't want that. Portrait of a graduate essential becomes the vision for a district. Uh, but it's, it's a little different than your traditional vision statement uh, that a lot of districts have. And if you look from district to district, they have fairly esoteric, grandiose statements that uh, are their vision statements. What we're suggesting here is a description of what is needed for all of our students to graduate. What are the skills, competencies, the mindsets that our students need to have to navigate this complex and rapidly changing world? And it becomes much more of a a descriptive and illustrative uh, example of what the vision is for a broader community. So after examining the world and how the workforce has changed, pace of change, social connections, how globally connected we are, then they began to talk about what are the competencies our young people need. And ultimately what we're trying to strive for is decentering the curriculum. The curriculum still content knowledge is still very, very important but it's decentered. The power comes with the connection of content knowledge. Okay. Decentered. Big word, right? Important word. Uh, content is still very, very important, but what do we know about phrases that have but after them? Everything that came before was a lie. Okay. Remember that. All right. Moving on. 
to number three. Oh, sorry. Let me get this uh, video file. Okay, number three. Is not just portrait on the wall. It represents the collective community's vision for what they want for the young people in their own community. So Karen, you, you've done so. Okay, community. They don't mean you. They don't mean parents. The collective, what the community wants for the children in their community. They're talking about the collective of school officials, teachers, administrators. This is put together by the School Superintendents Association. They are very concerned about the professionals, the adults. They're not talking about you. They're not talking about community like your town, your district. That's not what they're talking about. Okay, and going to the next one. Uh, okay, number four. We're really thinking about student-led assessment strategies, really giving students an active voice in how they want to demonstrate their own learning. And it's very rigorous, but powerful to have students have more. Very, very rigorous, but powerful. I'd rather rigor. I don't know about you guys, <laughs> but, you know, powerful. Say, and even selection of topics that are particularly interesting to them. We're working on a lot of, with a lot of districts around capstone and cornerstone type projects. There are many examples of this work. If you go to portraitofagraduate.org, there's actually a gallery walk. So you can see portraits from all over the country. All that the portraits are, are screenshots of what their websites now look like that they've been taking over by portrait or graduate. There's actually no information behind it. All right. So moving on to the next one. Um, and I'm going to show you that, that those portraits, don't you worry. Hang on. Let me get to it. Um, here we go. Number four. We're really thinking about student-led assessment strategies. Oh, no, we did this one. Sorry, my bad. Got to go to five. I had to break this up. If you're wondering, like, what, why are you doing this? Why are you doing this in this weird way? Uh, it's called copyright. <laughs> uh, a, a significant amount of students in our design teams, and that's what we recommend to school districts. And we have found the voice of the students so illuminating and um, really powerful. And this, the adults in the system are just floored by the insights uh, that our young people bring to that process. One of the issues that we're all dealing with. Okay, again, the adults in the system, they don't mean you. The adults in the system are just floored by the insights of the students. Aren't those the students they're supposed to be teaching that you pay to teach? You know, th those, okay. That's what I thought anyway. Um, okay, moving on. Then we're going to the next one is number six. Hearing for this teacher shortage is that the yes, in addition to the fact that the pay uh, for teachers is not what it should be, but that's been something we've had for a long time. Uh, but the other is the working conditions, uh, conditions that to some extent have been created as a result of COVID. You know how uh, uh, the parents seem to have turned on teachers and and uh, what teachers have had to deal with in terms of being abusive behavior on the part of parents and even on the part of students. So what you're just saying, uh, part of your findings suggests that that's something that you think uh, that if these conditions are changed, that that would uh, be a step towards uh, dealing with the teacher shortage? These problems are... So did you hear, folks? It's our fault. It's our fault and our children's fault. We abuse these poor put upon teachers. And that's why there's a teacher shortage. Couldn't possibly have anything to do with the conditions of, you know, not expelling problem students and letting violence run rampant. It couldn't possibly have anything to do with the fact that the smart teachers who don't want to indoctrinate their students have left. No, I'm sure it has nothing to do. With it. Couldn't be the mandatory vaccines that force a lot of people out of there because they're like, I am not your you know what? Okay, well, let's keep going because we still have a couple more. All right, number seven. With Patel for kids. Uh, from your perspective, how can this partnership bolster the momentum towards a new vision for our nation's schools? Well, you know, we need critical mass. And I think that's uh, more evident than ever before. You know, we uh, are very proud and appreciative of the opportunity, Dan, to partner with your organization and with Bill Daggett and the Successful Practices Network and, and Ray McNulty because we think now is the time. You know, and you know, it's very important uh, today that we reimagine what education can be for our young people and our educators alike today and into the future. 
you know, the, the private sector. There are for our educators and, and our students, you know, for the educate because definitely with the system is there for the educators. Did you know? Were you aware that the system exists for the adults in the system? And we have to make sure it's sustained for them. I can't imagine why the school superintendents association is so on board with this. The school superintendents are the only school employee that school boards have any power over. And it's slim. It's slim. Go check what it takes to fire a school superintendent under contract. Yeah. Anyway, we have one last one. One last video file. I really do. And I think the reason I, I'm confident we can is because you all have been working with the Learning 2025 districts. I was a part of the National Commission, which, you know, I'm, I'm grateful for that opportunity. And thank you, you for know, having done that. We very much appreciated that. We also have our network of school districts, and many of them have been yours and ours alike, have been engaged in this work for many years. Well, Karen, thank you so much. All right. So that's just that's just by way of introducing you to some of the people behind this and their lingo and their verbiage that they use. Now I'm going to share with you that was uh, Karen Garza. And yeah, her name would be Karen, wouldn't it? Um, so we're going to take a look at something about that. OK, so here we have a unifying vision. Portrait of Graduate is a unifying vision. Did you did you know that all the schools in America needed one of these? Were were you you know worried about that that they didn't have a unifying vision? Was that your concern, Mom and Dad? I can assure you I, that was like not even on my list of concerns when my kids were in school. Uh, so what do we have? Uh, we've seen our nation's public schools rocked by extreme angst and infighting during the past year. They mean us. We have witnessed neighbors, friends, and family members at such odds they no longer speak to one another. Well, I can't imagine why. We have seen many good people, including superintendents, educators, and school board members, step down after reaching their breaking point. These mean parents are so mean to me. They actually expect me to do what they want? What? The damage to one of our nation's most important institutions. Well, I would beg to differ on that one. Our local education systems will have long-term effects. Uh, can we take a moment and and pause here and remember who shut down the schools? And they were crap before that. But I'm just saying, you know, the the two years of turmoil and problems and things that brought parents looking at them going, what the f are you doing? Yeah, we didn't do that. We didn't build that. Today presents an opportunity to unite local communities around a competitive, they again mean school communities, not parents around a compelling vision for young people and reimagine the education systems needed to prepare them to succeed in a rapidly changing complex world. It is evident the traditional definition of success tied to a single test score has not served education systems or our students well. Notice they put the system first. It, I would agree it doesn't serve the students. But it's really backing up on the system because the system, as you all know, if you looked at the NAEP scores recently, is flailing. They can't hide anymore. It is now abundantly clear to the vast majority of parents that their kids cannot read. They cannot write. They cannot do math. They, th that school is failing across the board. They're being hosed tax-wise. There's inflation. They're getting screwed. And when that's, of course, a hidden tax. And the kids aren't learning. Now, this, look at the, this. <laughs> Portrait of graduate is a process that enables the full education ecosystem. Did you know it was an ecosystem? See, they can't have, we can't have a national education system. We can't have that. It's a violation of the constitution. So we have the U.S. Board of Education or the U.S. You know, Department of Education, um, USBE, I guess you would call it. And they come up with all these ways to fund side projects, so forth. But they're from below, from these people, they want one system so badly, but until they can shred the constitution for real, they can't really implement it from the top down. So they're looking for all these ways to make it happen anyhow. So they, they're starting by priming you with words. And one of those is ecosystem. And you, you think it sounds warm and fuzzy because, you know, ecosystems, those are like natural organic things, right? Yeah, no, this won't be organic. Hundreds of communities nationwide have designed their local portrait order graduate to build a new vision, uh, bring a new vision to life for education. The design process captures the community's collective vision. So we heard it in the podcast. We hear it here. The design process, near as I can tell, never includes parents. When they talk about design process, not you. 
Um, around the, how the world is changing. We heard that, right? So all the words are the same, same words. Now, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go through a presentation that I made this morning for you, because I think what's really important, you've heard the podcast, you heard words, you heard ecosystem, you heard, you know, all kinds of fluffy terms. I would imagine you came away knowing nothing, like really thinking, okay, I know no more about Portrait of a Graduate after listening to those clips than I knew before. All I know is it's some kind of unifying vision, which I'm not really sure I wanted in the first place, talking about communities coming together, but nobody asked me. I guess I'm not part of that community because no, you're not. And it seems pretty much organized around doing away with rigorous standards because those are high stakes. We don't want those. So I'm going to show you a presentation now about the principles of propaganda. Because I think it's going to help you understand, what is this? Oh, sorry. Um, it's going to help you understand uh, what they're doing. Because what happens when we see things like this, whether it's this, SEL, CRT, Second Step, Panorama, and I know you parents get overwhelmed. You're like, Deb, that's too many acronyms that I don't know. Or you'll get really focused on the trees. Like, is this panorama? Is this is this like second step? Oh, my school doesn't have second step, so I'm good. I'm SCL, is that this? Is that? Okay. I want to step back, way back, okay? And I want to teach you guys what the print, the 11 principles of propaganda. So no matter what they throw at you, no matter what they call it, no matter what fancy little words they keep repeating and repeating, repeating with different banners and different brand names and different initiatives, you start to go, oh, wait, and start asking the right questions. Okay. So we'll quickly go through that as quickly as possible. And then I'm going to show you the portrait of a graduate website and we're going to dig down, but with the, the principles of propaganda, hopefully in your brain while you're doing it. And so this is where you might want to take some notes. All right, here we go. Principles of propaganda. The first one you'll recognize is the principle of simplification and a unique enemy, right? Hate, racism, white supremacy, fascism, poverty, climate change, whatever. We're, we all have this enemy. Now, you may not have known you had this enemy, but you do. They'll tell you 24 hours a day. This is your enemy. It's everybody's enemy. We all agree. Let's move on. Then we have the principle of transmission. You have to have a well-defined well objectives and fight hard against the values that would be opposed to those that your brand represents. Now, brand here would be whatever it is, DEI, whatever. But here are some examples. DEI, 2030, SEG. These are the biggies. These are the big overarching commitments, right? And well-defined here just means easy to repeat. The names is shorthand to the point where people just get like hypnotized. You know, D this is for DEI. We have a committed commitment to DEI, DEI, DEI. The 2030 goals, the SEG. This is for SEG. This is for SEG. This is for DEI. And after a while, you're like, you know, but it's well defined. It's not, they're not long sentences. It's very short. The principle of transposition. This principle consists of charging the adversaries with errors, defects, and faults of their own. Now, who's the adversary? You heard it in the podcast. That, that That's you. Yeah, that's me. That That's parents who say, hold the phone. I don't understand what you're talking about. And I drop my kid off every day and I need to know. I need to understand. You're the adversary. Okay. So you're an error. You're abusing them. Ah, how dare you ask so many questions? You're so mean. Okay. So you have errors. You have faults. You're a prude. You're a censor. You're a book burner. You're a racist. You're a homophobe. You're a transphobe. You're all, all, all bad things. Of the 11 principles, this is the least ethical, okay? They use it, politicians use it, but so do all these people in education. They're lying straight up, gaslighting you, but they depend on it. They must do it. They must demonize you. And if you cannot deny the bad news, invent others to distract you. So blame someone else. You know, the schools are failing because you people aren't involved enough. Well, yes, look, at I'm so involved. Get out. You're too involved. It's never their fault. The principle of exaggeration and disfigurement, also known as the principle of insecurity. It's about using any anecdote, any detail, and turning it into a threat. So all they do is they create fear ah! in the people, right? Exaggerate a little, cause some more fear in the public. And then people are like, help us do something. Put mental health centers in the school. Your child is going to commit suicide unless we transition them. Mm -hmm. They're going to die. 
You get it? Like, we'll just put create fear. The climate, the, eh, you know, it, whatever it is, it's all fear-based. Then after causing the fear, or, you know, we use surprise, intrigue, or other strong emotion, any strong emotions to get people like, help us do something. They're going to rush in and buy the product. So if it's some SEL crap or if it's portrait of a graduate, very expensive. These these things are very expensive and it's your tax dollars paying for it. But you're going to run in and go, this is going to help, right? So the examples, of course, are mental health crisis. And they, it sells DEI. It sells SEL. It sells portrait of graduate. It sells whatever the heck they're trying to sell. And that's supposed to deal with the, the bad thing. Now, the principle of vulgarization. So the objective of this is to make things easy to understand and repeat. This piggybacks on the first principle that we talked about, where everything has to be clearly defined. Now it's going to be very clear and simple. Now you might think, Deb, there's nothing simple about this, nor is it clear. It's like as clear as mud. That's true, but it's easy to repeat and sound like you're smart. And the target audience here isn't really you. The point of you is to confuse you. The target audience are the educators, right? Who already are probably feeling pretty insecure because they don't know how to teach. They don't know the subjects they're trying to teach and they're in way over their head and they're a little bit scared, probably a lot scared because they're going to be evaluated and their results are going to be evaluated and they desperately need to blame it on somebody else and they need terms to hold on to. They can repeat over and over and over again and sound super smart, certainly smarter than you, like you know, they know more than you do. So it has to be popular. It has to adapt its level to the least intelligent. And they are the people in education, I'm sorry to tell you. And they use simple words so that people think they understand it. And then you even think you understand it. Vision, mission, diversity, equity, inclusion, right? You think you, think you understand it. But in truth, you're either assuming a positive meaning, so you're less likely to ask a probing question about what you mean. Oh, they're going to succeed and thrive and it's going to be wonderful. Or you're going to feel weird about asking. You're like, if I ask what they mean by this, is that going to make me the enemy that they talked about? Remember that adversary? Uh-huh. That's wrong and flawed and de defective. And they're, you know, they're going to make you seem disagreeable and negative. Why would you question something as important as thriving in the 21st century and having competencies? The principle of orchestration. The message should be repeated as much as possible. Well, now that it's simple and it's in nice little sound bites, just repeat it over and over again. And I think you guys have probably heard this. If a lie is repeated often enough, it ends up becoming true. Mm -hmm. or at least becomes the truth as people perceive it. So you repeat, repeat, and repeat the same concept in different ways. Our children need 21st century skills. Our children need 21st century competencies. They need to thrive in the 21st century environment because thrive, because they need. I mean, no, if nobody's going to stop them and go, who know, who said that? Why? Who? What? Then don't forget that the more resolved and firm you sound in expressing these ideas, the greater the impact. Because if you sound tentative, like I think they need to thrive and this is stuff. But if you're like, no, this is so important. Who's going to be the brave soul who's going to stand up and go, you're full of crap? The principle of renewal bombard the target audience with information and images. This prevents them from reasoning. I'll show you some of that. You'll see how that works, but I'm sure you've seen it all over social media. Pamphlets, pamphlets, rainbows, rainbows all day long. You know, look at the happy children. Look at the pictures of everyone succeeding. Look at the, look at the books with brightly colored everything and the teachers. Let's celebrate the teachers and celebrate the teachers some more. Hero, hero, hero. Just keep bombarding the audience that this is true. This is true with visuals. New information and arguments, we, look at me. I'm flailing, trying to keep up with what they're doing. They're very well-funded. They've got the best marketers around, marketer, propagandist, same thing. And they just respond to whatever we throw at them. They're already ready. They're already ready because they're playing a game and we're actually trying to get to the truth. And in addition, the new messages have to be consistent with the old messages so they work on the repetition principle too. They just feed on their own messages. The principle of likelihood. The principle is also related to the previous one. It consists of constructing arguments from different sources through so-called probe balloons or fragmentary inf information. There are no facts then. There's just interpretation. So as long as you break things up and it's on this podcast and that blog post and this social media outlet and this you know expert person, all you got to do is keep fragmenting and fragmenting it so it's like, 
Well, it it's not a fact based thing anyway. It's just this this thing, and then there's interpretation. But they all like it. <laughs> so we had the podcast and so forth, and I think we're all very familiar with this one: the principle of silencing. Bad news must be silenced. And today, since it's almost impossible to prevent the bad, we have the internet, right? We have social media. They can't truly silence us. So what they do is they use news stories to distract, distract, distract us, demonize us, you know, keep us busy or something else is going on. They put up fact checks. They do all kinds of stuff. So that what happens is people feel so overwhelmed. They either don't find out or they find out, but then they forget because then there's something new. They also employ professional crisis management teams. And if you weren't aware of that, let me be the first to let you know that they do. There are professionals out there that help them do this. The principle of transfusion, exploiting the beliefs, myths, feelings, hatreds, and cultural and traditional prejudices of the audience targeted for manipulation. I know y'all have been on the receiving end of this. Almost always, propaganda operates based on a pre-existing substratum. It is about spreading arguments that can take root in primitive attitudes, racist, homophobia, misogyny, this, that you're getting, Republicans, ew, Democrats, ew, libtards, own the libs, own the right, whatever, alt-right, the fascists are coming. All they got to do is divide along these primitive tribal lines. And we're so busy fighting amongst ourselves or even fragmenting within, you know, the, the parties, like people fighting this junk will fight amongst themselves about who's doing it right, who's doing it wrong. And they love this. They love it. It's awesome. And then many of their messages are put into, you know, jokes, memes, viral videos, whatever. So, and when, and here's an example, when they want to manipulate our children directly, which they do every single solitary day, they tap into the primitive desire of children to reject their parents, even some of their teachers, like teachers that would actually hold them accountable. And then of course, bullies. So all they have to do is say, those people are bullying you and they're bullying us. The principle of unanimity. Y'all know this one. This is the last one. Create the impression everyone agrees. Appeal to common sense, general culture, popular wisdom, the attitudes and beliefs that most people are supposed to have. On the internet, as well as in any media, generalizations allow people to identify easily. So they use them all the time. They use phrases that give the impression that everybody agrees. They put up these webinars, like we've assembled a wonderful team and oh, we're so glad to have so many people here, blah, 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 blah. And it's like, everyone is excited about, and I'm just so, we're, we're all so amazed. They don't ever say I, it's always we and our and they, and it's always made bigger than it actually might be. They might get an actual audience of like 20 people to watch one of their webinars, but then what they'll do is they'll publicize the crap out of it. They'll get everybody to it by saying, we were all so amazed at the results that we had. That's what they do. And they also use terms like evidence-based, follow the science, and experts say, right? So in any case, that is the... Um, that's the bit on propaganda I wanted to show you. And why that's important. Now, this is this is Deb's little pet peeve, and I might lose some of you. You might drop off after I do this, and I recognize that that is a risk. But I'm going to go ahead, and I'm going to do this anyway because I personally think it's, it's relevant. Um, and I don't make these analogies lightly. I really don't. But I just gave you a, a brief, rapid-fire lesson on propaganda. And you might be wondering, what, where where did these principles come from? Who wrote them? Well, believe it or not, they didn't come from Goebbels. They, they didn't. They actually came from U.S. marketing. United States, uh, we were at the forefront of marketing, advertising in the world. We, we, we invented it and we perfected it long before Goebbels ever got hold of it. He just took a lot of what he learned and he turned it to, you know, very poor use. But he did perfect it. And I think we can see from history that he did a whiz-bang job of implementing it for the specific purpose of brainwashing a nation. Okay? So the reason I wanted to read this little bit to you is to see if you hear anything that sounds familiar. Maybe you don't. Maybe you don't. So don't hear me saying, this is just like the Nazis. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that they are using propaganda and they are following these principles. And I hope after I read them, you went, yeah, that, that sounds really familiar. Uh -huh, that resonates. Okay. Because it just is, and I'll, I'll die on that hill that it is propaganda. Um, but 
I want you to understand how dangerous it is when we're talking about education and our children. And that's why I'm going to throw myself out the Overton window over here and, I, and, I, and I'm going to read this. Okay. Um, no other political movement has, under, uh, has understood the art of propaganda as well as national socialists. From its beginnings, it has put heart and soul into propaganda. What distinguishes it from all other political parties is the ability to see into the soul of the people and to speak the language of the man in the street. It uses all the means of modern technology, leaflets, handbills, posters, mass demonstrations, the press, stage, film, and radio. These are all tools of our propaganda. Whether or not they serve or harm the people depends upon the use to which they were put. No, he thought he was doing good. Understand this. They did not sit there thinking like, <laughs> okay. They really believe this was for the benefit of the folk. This is the best thing for Germany. This is what we need to do. And anybody who disagrees with us is a bad person. Okay. They did believe that. Um, now they're sadistic monsters too, but uh, that's because they had convinced themselves that the people they were fighting weren't people. In the long run, propaganda will reach the broad masses of the people only if at every stage it is uniform. Nothing confuses the people more than lack of clarity and aimlessness. The goal is not to present the common man with as many varied and contradictory theories as possible. The essence of propaganda is not in variety, but rather the forcefulness and persistence with which one selects ideas from the larger pool and hammers them into the masses using a variety of methods. National, and then they talk about national socialist propaganda as the most important thing. Um, and let's see, getting down to, it must be focused in a clear direction. So we must be focused in a unified goal, unified vision. And like I said, the reason I wanted to just touch on that is you have that principle of unanimity and you have the portrait of a graduate, which says that were, you know, the woman representing it, Karen said, that's a unifying vision. It's for a unified vision of this system, a unified vision of education in America. Now I want to go back here. I, you guys have been commenting fiercely and I thank you so much for participating. I wish I could read everything. I want to thank Coddle this so, so much for your super sticker. Thank you for your support. I really, really appreciate it. Um, this is, this has been rapid fire. I got something last night about this. I got something this morning about this. It's almost like it just blew up overnight. And I ha I want to shout out right now to my wonderful, wonderful whistleblowers who have helped me with this. This is sort of a co-production of unnamed, brilliant, wonderful parents who have been working hard with me behind the scenes to bring this to you, recording things off their screens, sending me links. We've been working fast and furious this morning to bring this to you. So I, I thank you all so ver very much from the bottom of my heart because I wouldn't be able to do this without your help. I just can't name them for obvious reasons. Um, so let's go take a look at the portrait of a graduate itself. All right. <clears throat> This will be super fun. Let me get the, the right screen. All right. Um, and my apologies for having everything be kind of up in the air because there's just so much to go through. Okay, here we go. Portrait of a graduate. Look at the pictures. Let's just linger here for a mo. Henry, Maya, Madison, Louise, and Way. Is there anything marginally creepy about this? <laughs> okay. So... You see them at the different stages of their lives, allegedly. You see the sort of Crayola crayon box of different people. So there's you got your, you've got your diversity and so forth. But to me, it projects a kind of an ownership of the children from like this whole throughout this whole process. And the other thing is that this system is picturing your child throughout this whole process as a little, you know, they put their name there, very personal. And this is typically something parents would do. Parents see their children this way. How do you feel about the state seeing your child like this? How do you feel about the state looking at your six-year-old and saying, let's let's have a portrait of your little child 13 years from now and then work our way backwards? H how do you feel about that? Wasn't that kind of your job and your child's job? Well, according to these folks, it should be the state's job. Not even the state. It should be the collective, the global collective. All right, so do you have a portrait of a graduate? And what they're meaning by that is you, the district. This is not aimed at parents. This is not for you. I mean, it's out there publicly, but it's not for you. It's by Battelle for kids. 
right? For kids, they go right around you, right around you. And they say, you know, your system's vision, your system's vision, system. What about the parents? <laughs> I, I'm sorry to tell you this, but the, the second you hand your child off to the system, it's no longer your vision. Whatever you had hoped and dreamed as you rocked your little baby to sleep after, you know, it was born about what their future might be like. And as a good parent, you probably said, I wonder who they'll be. I wonder what they'll want to do in their life. I wonder what their talents will be. I wonder what their interests will be. And I just want to support them in being who they want to be. And, you know, my vision for them is to be, is for them to have, you know, access and opportunity and freedom to pursue those things unimpeded and so forth. Right. I doubt, I mean, some of you maybe, but most people don't go, you're going to be a great doctor. You're going to be a fantastic AI operator. No, I don't think that people do that. Okay. But that's what the state's doing. That's what the state wants to start as soon as possible, figuring out if your precious little angel is going to be, you know, neatly fit over here or neatly fit over there where it needs them. Not where they want to go, where, where it needs them. Okay. First of all, what are 21st, what, what vision for the 21st century? We're only 22 years into it. Deeper learning. What's that? Every school system is unique, but are all connected by a shared aspiration. Are they? All students have an educational experience preparing them to thrive in the future. Well, this is like a long-winded way of saying water is wet. Like all school districts want their kids to succeed. I hope so. But it, that's one of those statements like in propaganda. Let's, you know, put the self-evident out there. Let's show something everyone agrees with. Everyone will go, oh, yeah, I want that too. So they got you agreeing and nodding and like, yeah, that, that's the thing. Yeah, of course we want our kids to succeed. And then they get down to it. Now more than ever. Don't you hate that phrase? Why, why now more than ever? <laughs> and how do you know? Well, the, that experience must not only provide for the acquisition of rigorous academic content. By whom? The system? You don't acquire rigorous academic content. You deliver it. You deliver it. But I guess they want to acquire it. But it must also be, there's always a but. Notice this. The messaging framing is this. Academic rigor, but. Academic achievement, but. This is important, but. So in case you were thinking you sent your kid to school to learn stuff that you thought they needed to learn, there's a but consistently look for it in any material you get from your school, look for the butt. And when you find the butt, everything after the butt is what your kid's really going to get. And everything before the butt is not. That's what they got to rope you into thinking that you can trust them. No, you're not getting any of that. Um, it must also be more intentional about fostering empathy, creative thinking, adaptability, and collaboration. Because apparently that's what it needs to be more intentional about. And nobody asks why. Nobody, I have seen very few people ask why schools are responsible for teaching empathy. First of all, you can't really teach empathy. If a child arrives at school and they haven't already been pretty well grounded in the foundations for developing empathy, they're probably going to be a behavior problem and they're going to need individual remediation. You can't take a whole class of kindergartners, first graders, eighth graders, 12th graders, whatever, and teach empathy. Like it's a lesson. It has to be modeled. Do you think this whole entire program where a bunch of adults sitting in a room somewhere counting their money are demonstrating and modeling empathy by the way they treat parents, by the way they treat even the teachers who disagree with this? How about the students at the bottom of the food chain who are going to be told what competencies and literacies they need to have to thrive in the 21st century? Do you think there's empathy demonstrated for them? So interesting how people who can't show empathy, who sit around privately mocking parents, deriding parents, attacking parents, accusing parents of being terrorists, calling us abusers, lying to us and teaching our children to lie to us. These are the people who are going to teach our children empathy and collaboration. I I'm going to go with probably not. Uh, plus more 21st century skills and mindsets. Again, what are those and who decided what they were and can we see them? Well, they'll sh I'll, I'll show you what they think they are, and then you can decide if you agree. Um, that our young people need to th survive. Young people, young people. Also notice, they are no longer called children. They're either called students or young people. And they're young people all the way down to six, possibly even three. Why? 
well, because one of the keys to this eventually is going to be getting rid of consent, as we've all discussed many times on this channel. So we've got to call them young people. They want them to have, you know, a kind of sexual citizenship. They want them to be completely independent of their parents as early as humanly possible. That's how they can build their little red guard to get us out of the picture completely. And so we don't talk about them as children or minors or students even. Sometimes students. But it's going to be young people from now on. Or the youth. By the way, the Nazis did that too. Youth. They weren't children. Because children implies they have parents. Uh, deeper learning. What the hell is that? Purposeful integration of rigorous academic content with experiences that intentionally cultivate skills, mindsets, and literacies essential. They're going to repeat these bogus phrases over and over again. Skills and mindsets, rigorous content, deeper learning. What? Let me just tell you something as both a lifelong learner and a former teacher, current teacher, I guess. Um, when you read even old books by long dead people written in syntax that we no longer use, and you become deeply educated, well-educated in a content sense about the world, its history, the different values of different people across the centuries, how they got that way, how they changed when you become numerate about math, all these things that we used to learn in just classical education, classical traditional education. Uh, you know what you develop? You develop a mindset of perspective. You develop a mindset of creative thinking because you've been witness to creativity across the millennia. You develop a mindset of empathy because you begin to realize, you know, not everybody's like me. I've read the stories of people from all over the planet, across the centuries, the trials, the tribulations, the heroism the joy, the hope, the dreams. Those mindsets come a little more naturally when you have that kind of content knowledge, kind of content exposure. What is rigorous content in this world? And do you really believe you can learn all the things I just described in snippets, in little readers, little lessons that are like, read this little passage and then we're going to talk about empathy. Do you think that's how it works? Is that how you learned empathy? Because someone gave you a couple paragraphs to read about somebody who suffered some horrible thing completely out of context. No idea what happened before, after, during, or anything else that led to it. Just this person is suffering. Let's learn about empathy. Do you think that works? Or do you think the kid's going, is this going to be on the test? Do, do I need to remember their names and stuff and the dates? I'm just curious. And then we'll take the test away completely so we won't even know if they learned that. Uh, now I want to point out that this little guy download the getting started guide. I tried that. I downloaded it because I wanted to show it to you guys, but here's a little thing that happens when you click on it. Um, I actually already requested it, but so I guess I can't show it. It makes you fill out a form. And I put this on Twitter where you have to choose that you're an educator or some other higher position. You can't just be other. They have another, but if you pick it, you don't get to download. So I had to put teacher. I had to put an organization name. The reason we learn. Then the button lit up and then I downloaded it and then I opened it up and you know what happened? It said that I can't show it to you. On the first first page, it says I can't show it without written permission. Do you think maybe that's a red flag? I don't know. I think so. So now we're going to talk about the gallery. Remember in the podcast, she said, in the gallery, you'll see how it works. Step back. What she's saying is the gallery will show you unanimity. The gallery will show you how many people are on board. The gallery will show you how far we've spread this poison already and how uniform it is and how much progress we're making at getting school districts across the country from different states, different regions and different, even like rural, urban, suburban, et cetera, to basically fall in lockstep with our unified vision. So let's take a look, shall we? All right. Here's the portrait gallery. I'm just going to kind of casually scroll. I want you to visually notice how much rainbow, how many trees, how many little diagrams of circles and charts like that. Look, seven pages. Seven pages that are five by four. So if you were educated, uh, you know, before 1998 or so, you might still be able to do that math. Maybe 1983 be able to do it lickety split in your head. Um, anyway, let's just keep, you know, let's just keep going. 
more rainbows, more circles, more trees, more rainbows, more rainbows, more rainbows. Okay, I urge you to take a look at this and see if your district is on here. Oh, more a tree and a rainbow, another rainbow. You get the drift, okay? But what happens when you click into one of these things and you take a look? Well, I decided I wanted to do that. So I went to take a look at the Winnetka Public School District in Illinois, District 36. This is where I began my teaching career at Greeley School. And we have a tree with little rainbow colors, <laughs> okay? Now, remember they said you'll see what their portrait of a graduate looks like. Well, you can take my word for it. I've clicked into these. It, it's the same. That They didn't like pick from hundreds of different values. They didn't pick from like, you know, things that were super unique to Winnetka, Illinois. No, they just chose graphics and colors and design. The rest is the same. It's literally the same. So you, do you have a portrait of a graduate? They mean, do you have our product? All right. So a Winnetka graduate is going to be the same as every other portrait of a graduate graduate. Empathetic, an effective communicator, resilient, a lifelong learner, collaborative, a creative problem solver, and a global citizen. There it is, a global citizen. What you need to notice when looking at the words in here, remember we talked about the propaganda and the repetition of words. None of this has any meaning. It, remember, we're going to get rid of these rigorous tests, but we're going to demonstrate awareness and understanding of other people's perspectives, feelings, experiences, and cultures. Makes authentic connections with others. How are they going to find that out? How are they going to evaluate that? The other thing you need to know is they talk in the podcast about how, the, and not just in the podcast, but in a video that Lisa Logan did, which I would also refer you to. I have a link I'm going to throw up in there. You can go watch it. It's timestamp link where she talks about how a portrait of a graduate has come into her district, specifically in Utah. There is your link. Um, and what she points out in this video, it's a video about transformative, you know, transformative SEL, transformation and so forth, but they've already adopted this. And what she points out is how they are very careful to say that these are not going to be measurable. They're not going to be measurable. They almost go so far as to make making things measurable sound icky. We wouldn't want that, right? So we have all of these things, but it's not really that important to measure them as long as we're working towards it. That's the key thing is our vision. Our vision is what matters. All right. So then I went to the website. I was like, well, maybe if I go to the school's website, I'll learn some more. Okay. So we look at the website. There's the school that I worked at. Okay. And we scroll through and like, oh, portrait of a graduate. Let's see what that's all about. Um, wait, where's the thing? And I showed you theirs, right? But I'm still looking. Kind of, I'm like still looking at, you know, where I click on portrait of a graduate and all it is, is this picture again. That's it. That's all it is. The same picture. The way of public schools and community empowers every student to flourish with an inclusive, innovative, experiential environment. We support and challenge all learners to actively engage in continual growth and achievement to make a meaningful difference in the world. It's all the same phraseology over and over again. So then going back over here. I went to the about us. I'm like, well, let's learn a little bit more about this portrait of a graduate stuff and these Battelle for kids. Who, who are these people? Well, they're a national not-for-profit organization with the mission of realizing the power and promise of 21st century learning. So again, 21st century learning, 21st century skills, 21st century needs. 21st, that's one of those, let's repeat it, let's repeat it, let's repeat it. People will not stop and go, how do you know what that is and, 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 and why is that the focus for my individual child? Have you been to the future? Did you invent a time machine? You know exactly what my kid's going to need 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 30 years from now, across the whole century? Wow, you guys must be really smart. That's what they want you to think. Um, we put our, our core values and dedication to diversity, equity, and inclusion at the center of everything we do and every decision we make as we collaborate with school systems, communities, and partners to achieve our mission. Not parents, school systems, communities of educators, communities of teachers and administrators, 
That's not you. Communities isn't you, but they purposely use the word because it's familiar. It's simple. Communities. Mm, I get it. No, you don't. Our headquarters in Columbus, Ohio. It's like middle town USA. So we think it's perfectly fine, right? Ohio, just nice, normal, average Americans. Um, our work centers on helping education leaders engage their communities. So education leaders, communities are whom? Teachers and administrators. To re-envision and transform their school systems, not up to them. Who anointed them? Who elected them? No. N-O. This is where it's all gone south. Is these people think they own the system. And for all intents and purposes, they do. And this is what I've been saying to parents all along is, you know, you want to take back that which was never yours. It wasn't yours from day one. Somehow you thought because they were at least localized for a while, you know, a few decades, and what because you had a school board that, it, you know, we own it, we pay the taxes. <laughs> no, they steal from you. You don't voluntarily play Jack Diddley. They put a gun to your head. They take your taxes. Then they come along and put a gun to your head and say, give me your kid. And if you don't, you better have another really good solution because, you know, you got to have your kid in school. So this we pay for it. It's like, no, you were robbed. And then they paid for it. That, that's how that works. That's how that works. Don't kid yourself. You didn't make a choice. You didn't sit there and go like, hmm, maybe I will put my money over here. Then you paid for it. Then you own it. You don't own it. Okay? We take a systems approach to promote enduring transformation. In other words, we don't want you people to undo it. Enduring transformation is we're going to change it. It's going to be permanent. And nothing you can do to unravel what we're doing. They want it to be equitable of the system and equitable, deeper learning outcomes for every student. Equitable outcomes, equitable outcomes, equitable outcomes. What does that mean? Can you deliver equitable excellence of outcome? Can you have a school of 500 people, 1,000 people, whatever, and have them all achieve at the same high level by any measurable standard? No, you cannot. No, you cannot. But you know what you can do? You can have equitable outcomes down here. That you can do. You can take your lowest common denominator and bring everybody else. That's easy. Piece of cake. So you can go and take a look at that. Oh, our DEI commitment. Let's take a peek. Our diversity, equity, and inclusion commitment. Battelle for Kids believes education is the critical foundation for cultivating, promoting, and accelerating equity. Remember she said, and it's an accelerator. We see portrait of a graduate as an accelerator. And a lot of parents might've heard, oh, it's an accelerator for improvement. And our kids are going to do better. And they're going to tackle all these problems that we've been having and they can't read and stuff like that. No, it's an accelerator for equity and inclusivity for society. But what they really mean is Equally malleable, inclusivity in the global economy, global, unified world government. We have a responsibility to advance deeper 21st century learning for every student everywhere, resulting in high quality, equitable experiences and outcomes. Again, with the equitable outcomes. They say they have a responsibility. Said who? Who said? Who gave them that responsibility? They're a not-for-profit private organization. Who's we? Far as I can tell, we parents have a responsibility to our children to protect them from people who co-opt their future without their permission or ours. But they anoint themselves, the holies of holies. This is like a religion, you guys. They are These people who are behind all these initiatives believe they are anointing themselves the new global church. No less than a new global church minus a God. The God is the state. Therefore, Battelle for Kids intentionally prioritizes diversity, equity, inclusion in all aspects of our work with school systems and partners. So remember they said that the community sits down at the table. When you listen to the podcast, you'll hear this. And then, you know, they, they co-create the portrait or graduate. It'll be their portrait. Each school district is unique. Doesn't sound like they really mean for it to be unique. It sounds like they intentionally prioritize diversity, equity, and inclusion in all aspects of their work with the school systems. That's the vision. That's the unifying vision. That is the future for your child. 
if they do not fit in to this vision, well, you figure it out where they belong. Our commitment includes inspiring others to envision and advance the creation of 21st century education systems while also increasing the diversity of school systems engaged in this work. In other words, we aim to proselytize and convert everybody. That's just a way of saying we're going to send missionaries out to convert everybody to our religion. Creating conditions and supports that empower every student to thrive with agency. That means they no longer need to go to their parents for permission to do stuff or have legal consent laws you know, preventing them from doing it. Voice, they're going to be empowered to use their voices even if they're but ignorant. And choice, again, with the mom, dad, shut up, it's my choice. To create a better tomorrow for themselves and others. Do you believe that? Do you believe their tomorrow is going to be better? First of all, who said today was so bad? A better tomorrow for themselves and others. Don't you think that should be their individual choice? Not Battelle for kids. What does better tomorrow look like, Patel, for kids? For them or other? Who are others? <laughs> who are the others here? Surfacing. Um, oh, no, of course, supporting school systems as they elevate. That means give preferential treatment to. Diverse perspectives. That means minorities of the broader community to build a shared vision of 21st century learning outcomes for all students. And by minorities, I don't mean people who disagree with them. I mean, the Crayola crayon box of people who look different than this and uh, have their shared values. Because if they if you look different, but you don't share their cultural values, you don't share their vision for the 21st century. Sorry, you're just going to have to shut up. Surfacing and addressing practices, structures, and policies that cause inequities to take root and persist because they know what they are. They so They know what they are, but they've held it back from us all this time, or they just figured it out. And this is the grand solution. But rather than put it to the voters, rather than use our democracy, <laughs> right, rather than use that and the Republican process of governance to appeal to us and say, parents, taxpayers, voters, we figured it out. We figured out how to address the practices and the structures that cause inequities in the first place. Will you vote for this, please? Vote for this solution? Wouldn't that be the transparent, better way to go about it than going, like, no, they didn't figure anything out. They just have a preferred way of solving this problem or not solving this problem because in not solving this problem, guess who still has a job? They do. Um, continuing to equip ourselves, educators and school systems, ourselves, meaning Battelle, <laughs> educators and school systems to achieve 21st century outcomes for all. We don't know what that looks like. What, what are 21st century outcomes? What 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 does that mean? Okay, so there's that. And then we went through the Winneka thing, and then we have that. And then uh, so I wanted to look at, you know, what what are they talking about with some of these things that they're focused on for themselves and for the educators? Human capital. Teachers are coming for you too. So teachers are people too. I mean, I'm not fond of a lot of them today, but there are those out there who are just like trying to do a job, trying to get paid, trying to support their families also. And uh, they're, they're coming for you also. So you're human capital now. You're not an individual person. You're not a professional. You're not somebody who can be appealed to at that level. You're human capital. And not only that, you're the human capital for the school system, but you will be producing, you'll be helping to produce the human capital for the 21st century workforce. So, you know, we have to be all aligned. We got to make sure you're the right kind of human capital so you can produce the right kind of human capital because people aren't people anymore. They're people widgets. They're people widgets. Okay, so we got to we gotta find the right kind of people. We got to grow them, train them, brainwash them, indoctrinate them. You know, we got to align them, make sure you need to. And we got to keep them after we've done all that. Well, it shouldn't be hard to keep them if you brainwash them successfully. Uh, and then reimagine every adult in the system. This is what you were doubting me that this was about the people in the system. There it is. Is integral to creating an educational experience that prepares students to succeed in a rapidly changing and complex world. Have you ever noticed how the people involved in education seem to be so knowledgeable about a world they don't live in? They don't live in it. This 21st century environment that they claim to know so much about, they don't work in it. They don't live in it. They live in this rarefied bubble 
within the bubble. They live in education. That's all they do. College, graduate school, school again. And they spend their whole life in this bubble. They are not out there having to make a living in the private sector. Not for real. They're just turning around and exploiting the same system that produced them. So how, why are we turning to them to tell us what our kids need? They don't know Jack. So you know who they turn to to find out? Oh, well, they turn to the UNESCO. Uh-huh. They turn to UNESCO. What do we need? Tell us, oh, oh, high priests of UNESCO, of WEF. What do we need? Then UNESCO, another bubble within the bubble, goes to WEF. What do we need? WEF, of course, who, you know, great reset. They're working for a tiny handful of oligarchs. They go, oh, this is what the 21st century needs. Do this. Okay. Then they go, this is what the 21st century is. They told us because they're the experts. Okay. This is what the 21st century is. These people do not have any firsthand knowledge of it. And by the way, neither does WEF. Because even the people of WEF are living in their own bubble because they're oligarchs. They're elite. They're way up here. They don't live with the little people. We're not people to them. We're not people to them. Identify the competencies that will help deliver on a 20 vision of the 21st century, deeper learning and be introduced to portrait. Of so far, have we learned anything about what the lesson plans will be, what our kids are going to actually learn, what they're going to say to our children, what, what this, how this is packaged, how this is delivered. We've learned nothing. We've learned nothing about what this actually is. We've learned how your district can make one of these. Looks to me like hire a graphic designer and go. That's what it looks like. How you actually achieve any of this is anybody's best guess. But I can promise you this. When they don't achieve it, and the only way you're going to know they don't achieve it is that you're going to say as a parent, my kid can't read, my kid can't write, my kid can't do anything, but they're really depressed and anxious all the time. And um, they want to constantly tell me I'm not empathetic enough. And they've reported me to Child Protective Services three times because I asked them to clean their room. And I don't think this is working. You're the problem. You're the problem. You're the adversary. But they're getting paid no matter what. It's always going to be us. It's always going to be us. We're the problem. We're the reason our kids. And you know what, guys? I'm sorry to say this, but um, if you leave your children in a system that does this to you, then you kind of are the source of the problem because you have the opportunity for another five minutes or so to get them the hell out of here. But when they come and they blame you, and they will, your children as well as these adults, when they blame you for the lack of measurable demonstrated success when your kids are roaming in the streets protesting or just, you know, lying at home cutting themselves with razor blades, it's going to be your fault. It's going to be your fault for going along for for not being involved enough in this process. It's going to be your fault for fighting this process. It's going to be in, it's your fault because you you vote the wrong way. It's going to be your fault because you read the wrong books. It's going to be your fault because reasons. They'll find a reason. It's never going to be their fault. Look at where look at the all the fear they're drumming up that tell us we need this. We need this, not just the positive because 21st century skills, but if you turn around and say you don't know what those are and you can't tell us what those are, they'll say, but mental health. They need all this to be mentally healthy. And you say, but what about COVID lockdowns and shots and force and that no, uh, we didn't do that. What? We didn't shut down the schools. The schools were never shut down because they had virtual school. Mm -hmm, yeah. People still in the building, just not your kids. So school wasn't really shut down. We talking about. That's their new narrative. School wasn't shut down. And then they'll turn around the next day and go, school wasn't shut down long enough, meaning closed for the poor, 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 poor teachers, poor babies. So that's what they say about that. Um, let's see what else we've got. Uh, how do they make sure that the human capital is properly brainwashed? Look at that pretty little picture of a brain. <laughs> they have professional cohorts and learning cohorts and professional development. Right. And these things are expensive. These are really, really expensive, you guys. Um, let's take a look at some pricing and registration if you wanted to, you know, do one of these. Uh, let's see, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, it's uh either five hundred dollars or six hundred and fifty dollars to go to one of these little classes. Ka ching, ka ching, ka ching, ka ching. Your district's paying for that. Uh-huh. So there's that. Um, then we have these speakers, they have webinars for each of these things. Isn't it cute? Look how they set up their little speaker things, how the world has changed. 22 years into the 21st century, our school system's keeping pace. Not our children keeping pace, not our parents, not our family. No, our school system's keeping pace. It's all about the system. The system is their baby. The system is what they care about. 
not your kids. Your kids, they rarely talk about your kids. Um, and then we have, here's some more stuff about, these are their insights, some articles and everything, you know, strategic plan aligns with the whole child approach. Yeah. This is what, uh, Kelly, uh, if you're not familiar with Kelly S you have to go, um, follow her because uh, she's with, uh, um, a time to stand podcast. She covers whole child approach. So does Lisa Logan. Okay, so you need to follow both of those people and you'll learn a lot more about the whole child approach. Um, you know, how can we activate our portrait of a graduate? You can go read about that. So you guys can go find out more about the stuff. You go to portraitofagraduate.org or batelforkids.org and you can go down rabbit holes all day long. Um, I could sit here with you now for probably three, four more hours and go down all, all this stuff, but I think you get the point. Um, but remember I said there are little acronyms like, SEL for SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals, UNESCO. This is where they're getting their direction as far as what 21st century stuff is. This is where they're getting it. Okay. And what else do we have? As far as the group um, that is that has sponsored this or the, behind the podcast and the one that's really pushing this, into the schools, recommending it, telling school boards, this is a great opportunity. We should totally do this. If they even have to, I'm not even sure they have to. I think the superintendent is empowered to do this on his or her own and or the state level superintendent. I know in North Carolina, it's our state superintendent of public instruction that decided that two schools are going to do this. It wasn't even at the, it wasn't at the district level. It was at the state level. So if you have a state superintendent or commissioner or whatever, they're part of these groups too. And they've decided. So these are named school districts to help transform America's. Oh, they're so helpful, right? These are the pilots. So remember in the propaganda lesson, we talked about these trial balloons. He's putting up these balloons and like kind of letting it be become just part of the thing. And they're doing it. Must be right. Must be good. They don't come back and tell you, we did a trial balloon, didn't really do anything. Um, So, you know, it was like an experiment. No, it's an experiment only insofar as getting you accustomed to its existence. And getting you to believe that this is an extra good, wonderful thing, that you're, this is an opportunity, not getting you to think of like, let's take a look at this experiment and see if it worked. No, it didn't work. Let's not do it. No, you don't get that opportunity. So they're helping to transform America's education system and the attitudes of people towards it. That's what they're trying to do. So what they do is they have the money. It says participating school systems will engage with AASA's Learning 2025 Network for professional learning collaboration and resources. The fee for Learning 2025 Network Engage system is $3,500 for AASA members and $4,000 a year for non-members. So if your school district or is a member of this or your superintendent is, then it costs that. Ask about the Engage systems and they can be part of this. They can be part of this in a bold effort towards a holistic redesign. Holistic. Does this feel holistic to you? Of our nation's schools, more than 60 school systems across the country have joined AASA's Learning 2025 Network of Demonstration Systems. Demonstration. Except they aren't going to evaluate it in any objective way. So what are they demonstrating? Other than we're all in sync on this, and if you're not, you're on the outs. Um, our goal is to galvanize, there it is, and synergize, there it is, thought leaders from all sectors to emerge from the pandemic in better shape than they were before, said Daniel Domenic, executive director of ASA. He's the talking guy. I think he's the talking guy on the podcast. This initiative will ensure that educators are empowered and equipped to meet whole learners' needs, not, not just part of the learner, the whole learner, their psyche, their health, all of it. By personalizing, and that's the other word, youth and learners, young people, youth, learners, I don't even think we use students anymore. They're learners. Um, customizing instruction involving oh, their students and designing their own learning, designing their own learning. The kids who know nothing and can barely read are going to design their own learning. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm a big fan of certain kinds of self-directed learning, like within a structure. But given this population is 70% illiterate, 70% are illiterate roughly 70% are enumerate. I, I'm, I'm thinking maybe that would be like the blind leading the blind. I don't think we would do that. No, I don't think so. Do you want your future brain surgeon to have picked his own curriculum? So 
And you might say, well, that dad, that, but then they go to college. Are they going to be ready for college? Are they going to be ready for medical school? Are they going to know enough to even go to these places and achieve anything there? Or are you unaware of the fact they're doing this at the high, higher ed level too? Everything's been dumbed down because the kids that come out of this system are not going to be ready for anything rigorous up there. They're spending too much time talking about empathy and compassion. Um, so the demonstration system will receive senior consulting services, personal engagement, and strategic planning supports for their district. Ka-ching, ka-ching, ka-ching. Create a customized action plan tailored to meet the needs of their district. No, it isn't. It's literally cookie cutter. And there's no way for you to know because it's proprietary. <laughs> anyway, uh, gain a customized dashboard to track their district's progress using what? They're not using objective measurements. And provide real data to community stakeholders. Again, those are internal stakeholders. They're not parents. What real data? The data is going to be how many people are on board and participating and not complaining about it. The evaluating progress is progress of implementing this global, you know, unified vision. That's the progress. If you hear progress and you think student progress, you think any kind of test score improvement. No, you're, you're misunderstanding what progress means. You're misunderstanding what alignment means. You're misunderstanding what, what, what achievement means. It doesn't mean what you think it means anymore. Um, take part in professional learning opportunities, contribute to national research. That means data mining. They're going to data mine that crap out of your kids with this network, collaborate and learn with school systems that are committed to supporting again, the whole learner, ensuring anti-marginalization and adopting future driven practices. Now I'm going to say something mean or ask a question rather. It's going to sound mean. Do you think there is an appropriate place anywhere in a school for the marginal marginalization of anybody, be it teacher or student, because I do. I think that teachers who are in the school to push their political agenda and groom your children should be marginalized right out of the building. I think that students who are creating a violent ruckus in the hallway, the bathroom, the classroom all day, every day, and are demonstrating that they are antisocial and have no interest in cooperating with anything, even your crazy commie vision, uh, should be marginalized right out of the building. This notion that nobody should ever be marginalized, punished, dealt with harshly, whatever you want. I I'm sorry. This is why we are where we are. Punish everybody equally is e equitable outcome. Collective punishment. Reduce everybody to begging for crumbs. Because when we're all equally begging for crumbs, begging for universal basic income, be begging for the state to employ us in some way. And they've gotten to a point where AI is doing most of the really interesting tasks, possibly up to and including operating on your brain, if you want to trust that. Then the humans, what purpose for the humans except to produce more humans? At least those of us who are still capable after, you know. What purpose? What's our role going to be? Are we going to be allowed to think creatively and create our own jobs? Are we going to allowed to invent things that the current, you know, micromanagers of the 21st century haven't ever thought of before? Are we going to be allowed to do that? Are we going to be allowed to say no to AI? Are there still going to be people practicing medicine, you know, with their hands and their own brains and not a computer? Can we ask these questions or are we now the adversary? So you'll want to check down this long list. There's two right here. In North Carolina, where I live, Union County being one of them, a lot of people move down there. Big, fancy houses, Union County. A lot of people think, oh, good schools here. Yeah, definitely. Very good schools. Mm. Well, they're participating in this. So there's that. I think that about covers going through. Like I said, I could I could keep going through the document itself or the, um, the portrait of a graduate itself, but... I'm going to guess that you guys sort of kind of get the gist of it in the sense that, you know, these words are just repeated over and over again. To summarize, it is a way to get DEI wrapped around every district, whether you have a DEI director or a DEI office, equity office or not. It's a way to disguise all the things that parents have been whining about, I shouldn't say whining, you know, it's legit. Um, parents have been complaining about CRT, SEL, et cetera. It's a way to disguise it as this grand vision that's going to help your child, except your child is oddly absent, except in these creepy Stepford pictures. 
I mean, this is super creepy. I'm sorry. I just me looking at it. I think it's super creepy. Um, they they talk about being disruptors themselves. If you listen to the podcast, but all they're disrupting is the tradition of education as something that happens for the individual child. They're disrupting the notion that parents have a say in their edu their child's education. They're disrupting the notion that local communities should decide what their local children need, not people in Ohio who are answering to people on the other side of the ocean, none of whom are going to have to live in the actual local community that these children have to live in or the actual future that they have to live in. I'm pretty sure Klaus Schwab is, you know, being propped up by regular transfusions like Keith Richards or something. But I mean, these people aren't going to be here when our kids are grown and have to deal with the consequences of their perfidy. And personally, I think that when you are shown something like this by your school or when you go and find it or you hear about it, and we have portrait of a graduate, it's awesome. You should be able to go to every page on the website, every document, you should be able to read the annual report, you should be able to read all of it and instantly know what that means for your individual child. You should be able to look at this and go, I know exactly what the 21st century skills are and I agree with them. I know what these literacies and competencies are and I agree they can be taught. I agree they can be taught by these people in this environment. I agree with the premise that this is what school is for. I agree with the premise that these are the right people to decide what school is for. If you can't do those things, if if that's like you're reading it going, ah, they must be smarter than I am because it's like, I mean, they're simple words, so I think I understand them. I don't want to admit that I don't because then I might sound stupid. That's what they're doing. That's the propaganda. That's how you know it's propaganda. If you don't readily understand it, if you can show it to your eighth grader and say, make sense of this for me, like in plain English. And if they glaze over and go, well, they're teaching us to the 21st century competencies and we're going to be the 21st century, 21st century competent. You have a problem. If you have a kid that goes, that's a bunch of garbage. I have no idea what it is. I'm just like trying to get through the day. <gasps> Count your lucky stars. There's still some of your child left in there. And get them out before the rest of it is gone. But they're wasting their time. And that is not to say that the kids in these schools, that this is happening, are getting zero knowledge, zero teaching. They got to fill their time somehow. They're going to have lessons and crap. They're going to do some reading. They'll do a math program here and a math lesson there. And, you know, what it is to say is that none of it, none of it is what you deserve, what your children deserve. None of it's going to truly be deep learning. It's going to be very shallow, very shallow. What they mean by deep learning is deep indoctrination. They want to get inside your kid's neurology. They want to get inside your kid's head so deep using their surveys, using data, data extraction, and algorithms. They want to learn deeply about your children so they can make predictions about them, you know, what they will like, what they will buy, what they will need, what they will want, right? And that brings me to something fundamental that that same propaganda said. Propaganda works best when those who are being manipulated are confident they are acting of their own free will. This is the secret of propaganda. Those who are to be persuaded by it should be completely immersed in the ideas of the propaganda without ever noticing that they are immersed in it. The truth is the greatest enemy of the state. So I always aim to bring you the truth. You may disagree with my assessment of what it is, and that's totally fine. I urge you, however, for your sake, for your children's sake, for the sake of the United States of America as a sovereign nation, please go look at these documents. Listen to the podcast for yourself. Listen to it for yourself. I believe I put the link somewhere in the, in the early comments. Let me go grab it for you again, just to make sure, because I don't want you to miss out on it. Um, why is this not letting me? Ah, here we go. Oh, 
my computer is having. All right. So there is the podcast. It's only 10 minutes short. I played you eight little clips that my whistleblower sent me. Um, thank you again. You're wonderful. I hurt you. <laughs> um, you guys, seriously, I, I'm indebted to several people, not just for this broadcast, but in general every day. You have no idea what goes on behind the scenes. I don't really have a producer. Um, it's just me, but I depend on people uh, outside here. So that is to say, if you can't use your own voice for whatever reason, you're afraid of getting fired, you're afraid of your kid facing retribution, there are people out here. I'm one of them. Kelly is one. Lisa Logan is one. There are there are several people out here willing to be your voice and willing to share what you find and bring it to the fore. And we will take pains to make sure that your identity is not revealed to protect you. We've already We've already stuck our faces and our names out here, so we can do it. But um, but I urge you to look um, to look at these materials for yourself, and you decide. Making informed decisions is the most important thing. You should know what you're sending your kids into. You should be able to understand it or feel satisfied that the parts you don't understand are in good hands. That you truly trust these people. That's all I'm saying. Now, I've obviously, I'm very opinionated and I obviously have my view of this, but I just know that too many parents don't even know this is a thing. Like they don't even know this is happening. They're just trying to get through the day. They're trying to go to their jobs and make money and pay their bills and function. So that's why I'm bringing this to you. And I hope you found it useful. And uh, if you have further questions, please drop them in the comments after the video is on replay. Please do like and share the broadcast so that other people who are not able to make it can see it. And I will make sure that these various links are in the show notes after the show as well. So you can you know, share this broadcast and let people know that the reference links are in it. Um, I will even give you a link uh, to the Google Sheets document in a Google drive. And I will put that link down below as well. So that that will be shareable uh, to the public. Okay. So thank you guys so very much for coming. I, I feel like I, I miss so many comments in here, but I appreciate your, um, you know, participating and just venting and getting stuff out for other people to see. And I will go back and read through all of them uh, after afterwards. I don't probably be tomorrow because they don't let me even see the live chat until the next day. Thanks so much, everybody. Thanks for coming. I hope you have a great rest of your afternoon and week. Take it easy.